Okay, we are a little bit behind uh, schedule, so let's get started. Welcome again. Uh, we will now discuss a topic that has not been addressed um, in this conference uh, before, which is the nexus of security policies and climate change. Um, the interest in this topic on a global level is uh, rapidly increasing, though. Um, only in January this year, the United Nations Security Council called for an open debate on this issue, uh, and it turned into an eight hours debate with more than 80 speakers. Um, it's not a very new topic, though. Um, already in 2009, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution on it and asked also the Security Council to prepare a special uh, report on this matter. And if you look back in these past 10 years from 2009 to today, we can really see that a lot of technical solutions have been developed that will help us to limit climate change and also that international investment, green investment, is really growing. Um, and, of course, on a multilateral political level, we do have the Paris Agreement in place now since 2015. But what we can also say is that we really have a lack of ambitious climate action on the level of nation states, especially including, I must say, all uh, governments of this region. So in Paris, uh, the world basically agreed to limit climate change to 1.5 to 2 degrees. We uh, by now managed to heat up our planet by 1 degree, and we can all see the consequences, droughts and heat waves, and uh, so on. But uh, despite these alarming signals we can all see, we are still on a pathway to heat up our planet to 3 degrees or 4 degrees or even more by the end of this century, and we will now hear three speakers from three different countries telling us what security challenges we will have to face, or we have to face already now in a plus one degree world, and what uh, challenges we will have to face in a three, two, four, or more degree world. So please welcome, first of all, Mrs. Kira Winke from Germany. She is a researcher at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and that is an uh, institute that is very renowned, especially for climate modelings, and you will share one of uh, several of your models uh, with us. And she has also been invited to become the co-chair of a very special institution in uh, Germany, that is the Advisory Council of the German Government on Civilian Crisis Prevention and Peace Building. So welcome, Kira Winke. Please also welcome Mrs. Teresa Sabonis-Health. Uh, she's a professor of national security strategy at the National War College in Washington, D.C. And uh, she's also a member of NATO Defense uh, College Advisory Board. She is an expert both uh, on energy and on water and for this region. And she has uh, done a lot of uh, research, especially on the South Caucasus, but also in Central Asia. And last but not least, please also welcome Mrs. Nino Antaze, um, who is uh, obviously an expert not only for the region but from the region, and who is a team leader at UNDP uh, for energy and environment and has worked a lot on disaster res uh, response especially. So my name is Sonja Schirmbeck. I'm a policy officer at the FES headquarters in Berlin, uh, working on both South Caucasus and Central Asia on the one hand and on climate and energy policies in Central and Eastern Europe on the other hand. So um, we will proceed with the opening statements, seven to 10 minutes, maybe looking at the time rather seven minutes um, in the order that is in of speakers that is indicated in the program. So Mrs. Winkel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, to understand the full scope of the climate crisis, I will first take you back into human history, about 100,000 years. So please bear with me, I will, I will end at the future. Um, but first we will have to go back in time to understand what is happening today. So what you see here is the change in temperature measured from ice cores um, in the last 100,000 years. 
So what you see is that the Earth has moved through various uh, changes in global mean temperature, and um, we see that in certain points in time, for example, at the 80 to 70,000 years ago, um, there was an eruption of a volcano, which led to huge changes in the climate, in the global mean temperature. And what did this mean for us Homo sapiens? 100,000 years is about half of the time that Homo sapiens we have been on Earth. During the time of this big changes, 70,000 years ago, we almost went extinct. There were only a few Homo sapiens left on Earth, a few thousands. The population could have been considered unstable. And we land our planet Earth here in the last 11,000 years, the Holocene, what we call climate paradise. You can see from this graph that this is a period that is marked by climate stability. And the last 11,000 years, the Holocene, is the time in which human civilization as we know it developed. The Neolithic Revolution happened, we as humans became settled, we performed agriculture, we built cities. Also, our population increased tremendously in this period of time. And then, at the end of this period, uh, we have the Industrial Revolution. And here again, you see a graph of the Holocene, about 10,000 years now, and the development of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. This is a graph from the IPCC in 2007. And unfortunately, the CO2 concentration doesn't end there. 2018 was at 410 ppm. And I just looked it up. Um, it's not marked in the graph, but now we are at 414 parts per million ppm of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. What does this mean? We all know about the greenhouse gas effect, and we all know that it leads to a warming of the, of the planet. Here again, the Holocene, we see the spike at the end of the graph here, the increase that is not natural of global mean temperature. So currently, as you said, we are about one degree above pre-industrial levels, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a panel that consists of scientists from almost all nations, has found out that climate change has led to observed impacts across all continents and across all oceans. Extreme precipitation, I was here yesterday, um, you can see it in, in the city here, hail, extreme rain, these type of events have become more frequent in various regions. Droughts have become more frequent and intense, the sea levels are rising, the glaciers are melting. We are in the time of climate change, there is no doubt. What does it mean for the future? At the Conference of the Parties 21, the COP21 in Paris, all nations agreed to limit global warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels. We are already at 1 degree. What is the difference between such a Paris consensus and a business-as-usual scenario? A business-as-usual scenario would land this planet at 4 degrees by the end of the century. It doesn't seem much more than 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees, but the effects are tremendous. You see here the increase in the mean temperature in the summer, and you can also see the region we are talking about today, the South Caucasus, here in the picture. In the summer, we can see that the um, business as usual scenario would increase the mean temperature by six degrees almost all over the region, and by eight degrees in some regions in the summers of June, July, August. You can imagine what the peaks of such an extreme summer would look like. In a Paris consensus scenario, on the left-hand side, we would largely avoid such extreme increases, but still would have moderate increases of the mean temperature of about two degrees. So we see that four degrees doesn't only mean four degrees on the global scale every month, but it actually means that in the summer, we have peaks that are in the mean higher 
than six degrees or eight degrees. And then what is especially worrisome is this graph. And this is a bit more complicated, but please bear with me. I will walk you through it. Again, we see on the left-hand side the Paris consensus scenario, and on the right-hand side the business-as-usual scenario. And on the upper column, we are looking at summer heat extremes. These are events that in a normal climate that is not uh, changed um, would happen every once in 740 years. So it's quite unlikely that any one of us would experience such an event. And then on the lower column, and this is the really worrisome part, we are talking about unprecedented heat events for the respective regions, which occur every once in three million years. These are events that are virtually absent from the current climate that none, no human being has ever seen in this region. And you can see here that in a business as usual scenario, especially in the region that we're talking about today, 40, 60% of all summers by the end of the century would see such extreme events. For this unusual events, the numbers are even higher, 80 to 100% of the month in that region would see such extreme events. In the Paris consensus scenario, again, you can largely see that such events can be avoided. Going back to the global scale, why was the two degree target agreed upon? And what are the risks associated with it? You can see again the temperature reconstruction here and then the measurements on the little black line there. And you can see the different pathways of emissions over the next centuries. A high mitigation scenario, a Paris consensus scenario, would stabilize the Earth's mean temperature, whereas a business as usual scenario would, over a longer period of time, lead to global mean warming of eight degrees or more. This is not by the end of the century. Here, this graph goes to 2,500. But this is exactly still the path that we're on, this red path. So this is not a completely unlikely scenario. And what would this mean for the Earth's climate and for the Earth's system? Because when we are talking about these increases in mean temperatures, we're also talking about um, tipping elements that are caused by these temperature changes. Tipping elements um, are systems, parts of the systems of the Earth system um, that are um, large and they may change non-linearly. So humans are very well adapted to linear change and they can manage linear change quite well. However, we're not very good at managing non-linear changes. So these are systems such as coral reefs, which may appear to be stable, to, to, be, to be healthy for a long period of time until they suddenly change into a different equilibrium. And for the coral reefs, we have already seen some signs of so-called tipping of the Great Barrier Reef, where we have mass coral bleaching events in short succession, meaning that a lot of these reefs are dying and will likely not recover. So you can see these different tipping elements in these uh, red and yellow shades here. It's the Western Arctic ice sheet, the Greenland uh, ice sheet, coral reefs, Amazon rainforest, forest, the thermaline circulation, um, the Enzo system, meaning the El Niño and La Niña system. And you can see that some of these systems, these tipping elements, are already associated with the Paris range. And this is why the well below two degrees was agreed upon to limit these, these risks. Because we know, for example, for the coral reefs, that in order to save only 10% of the coral reefs, we would have to limit global warming to, to 1.5 degrees and not go to 2 degrees. And this is the basically in one graph um, the reason why nations agreed to um, limit global warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees, so that in order to avoid the tipping elements that are under this business as usual path.
We also know that already climate change and its impacts can uh, lead or contribute to conflicts and social tensions. But it's a very complex issue and it's a very multi-causal issue. And I would just like to present to you what the current state-of-the-art scientific knowledge is on this issue. So for this, I took out um, basically three quotations from papers that were um, really important in this field. And the first one was published in PNAS. There is evidence that the 2007 to 2010 drought contributed to the conflict in Syria. It was the worst drought in the instrumental record, causing widespread crop failure and a mass migration of farming families to urban centers. Then the next one is a study that was conducted um, by our institute. The risk of armed conflict outbreaks is enhanced by climate-related disaster occurrence in ethnically fractionalized countries. And droughts can contribute to sustaining conflict, especially for agriculturally dependent groups and politically excluded groups in very poor countries. So what does this mean in simple terms? It basically means that if a drought hits a country like uh, Germany or maybe um, a state like California, it may lead to tensions, may even lead to some sort of conflict, but it not, doesn't lead to violent conflict. But once it hits states um, where there's already fragility, where there's deficiencies in governance, such as in Syria, it may be the straw that breaks the camel's back. So with this, I hand over to you to discuss more in depth what this means for this region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Winke, and also for highlighting especially that uh, if we move beyond this 1.5 to 2 degrees Farbert, then climate change is no longer in our hands. It becomes by itself reinforcing and uh, irreversible, basically, for, for humankind. So now we are uh, moving to uh, Teresa Saboni Health. Let me just get your presentation. Okay, here we go, starting with the earth on fire. I come from the more traditional security community, um, and it, there is a real debate about how should we think about climate change. So I'm gonna focus on a few very specific aspects of climate change, because for those who are not already accustomed to it, the, the very broad meta problem can be quite overwhelming. What I'm going to look at specifically is some of the efforts to assess what climate change could mean for the Caucasus. Now, if we look at recent, relatively recent assessments about climate change and security in the South Caucasus, what we find is many of the events that are examined and discussed have to do with water and the impacts of water on agriculture. What we also find is if you just aggregate what everyone says about climate change, you get the appearance that Georgia has more high risk than anyone else. In fact, that's a reflection more of the state of analysis in Georgia compared to other countries rather than the state of climate risk. Because in Georgia, partly because of the relationship with the European Union, the analysis has been done in much more depth and to much more granularity. And what we find in Georgia is that there's been a fair amount of mathematical modeling, there's been a lot of in-depth analysis. Um, but in the case of Georgia, there are significant impacts, and I wouldn't suggest that we shouldn't be concerned about them. And I will say that the quality of research in Georgia, which is quite good, is not yet reflected in policy. But let's think about this for a moment. We have three small countries who individually and even collectively contribute very little to the global climate change problem. 
So when we try to understand security in these countries, how should we think about it? Well, I would suggest that we start with something very concrete and very clear. And that has to do with the basin view of the region. Now, this map shows you the upper and the lower rivers that I'm going to talk about. But let me move to a map that gives you a clearer sense of where the national boundaries are. What you see is that the entire region, with the inclusion of parts of Iran and Turkey, all are contained within the Kura Iraqs basin. And what that means is how the water moves across this basin is going to be very important. Now, the United Nations is working on defining water as a human right. And if you think about that for a moment, you understand intuitively, if I withhold water from you, you will die. So in a sense, water is a human right. But we also know that if you don't treat water as a commodity that has value, then it doesn't get used well. So somewhere in between water as a right and water as a commodity, nations have to figure out how to keep their people supplied with the water they need for the, for the lifestyle that urban societies expect. And complicating that a little bit is going to be, as you can see from this map, rivers cross countries. Now, if a nation were to ignore the UN recommendation that water belongs to all the riparian states, in other words, if all the states on a river cooperatively think about how to manage water, the river will be healthier, security of, the human security in the region will be better, but states could choose not to do that. So in a world where water is being distributed differently than it used to be, what does risk look like? This map shows you how much of the water in any given state originates outside of that state. Now, of course, it doesn't reflect power realities. A weak state, Brazil does not is not where most of the Amazon originates, but the small states that come before Brazil are not able to deny water to Brazil. So this doesn't exactly show you who could do what to whom, but it does show that risk is distributed a little bit differently than you might think. And if we zoom in on our region, what we see is that for Armenia, 11% of the water in their country originates outside of Armenia. For Georgia, 8% originates outside of Georgia. For Azerbaijan, 77% of the water in Azerbaijan originates outside of their own territory. In Iran, 7%. Turkey, in a sense, is the headwaters. They're the least reliant on other states. And by the way, Turkey is one of the states that disagrees with the UN premise that water belongs to all the riparians. Turkey argues that water belongs to the nation where it originates. And the nation where it originates can make legitimate political decisions about who else has access to that water. China concurs with the Turkish assessment of how water should be distributed. So now if we think about this, if we think about this, we can hope that we will see better cooperation in water. But you know, we are up against a truth that is so old that it is baked into the English language. The word rival comes from ur vilis, which is two who share a river. So let's think about this. In a world where we're getting either less water or often more water too suddenly for human communities to be able to make good use of it, as we saw yesterday, what does water sharing, what does regional security look like? Now, these are a couple of different ways of looking at water availability and use. And what I've done is I've highlighted in red the one country in each category, or in each category, what country seems to be having the most problem. So, I want to actually begin with the far right-hand one. You're very used to the idea that we measure um, energy intensity of GDP, we've been doing that for a long time. It's a much newer thing to measure water intensity of GDP. When we look at how much water a country uses to produce the equivalent of one dollar worth of GDP, how well are countries doing? And what you see here is that Turkey is actually pretty efficient and 
Armenia is very inefficient. In the current five-year plan of China, it is a state goal to increase the water efficiency of their GDP five times because China is aware that they are so inefficient that in five years of really focusing on this problem, they could actually increase their productivity five times. Now, other states have not looked at it in that granularity, but just keep in mind, for a state that never focused on it before, it is possible to make huge gains. Now, if we move again, starting from this side, to the water dependency ratio, I already mentioned and showed you those. In this instance, Azerbaijan is the most at risk because most, so much of its water originates outside of its own territory. Then if we look at how much renewable water per capita, so this isn't just your rivers, this is how much rainfall do you receive. Again, we look at Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan is a country where desertification is a fairly profound climate change related problem that they need to focus on. Look at how slight, and Azerbaijan is the country where they're committed to raising their population for political reasons. They are already considerably water stressed. Azerbaijan meets the definition of a country of concern already for its water resources available per capita. And then if we look at where does the most rain fall every year, we see something interesting, and that is, although Iran has access to the headwaters of some powerful rivers, actual rainfall in Iran is so small that they're very dependent on the rivers. And in fact, many of you are aware that a few years ago, Iran tried to negotiate a water agreement with Georgia, whereby Georgia would commit to putting in a water pipeline to supply Iran with water. Georgia demurred after considering it seriously for a while because, of course, moving water requires energy and promising to provide Iran with water is a deal that could turn out to be quite dangerous. But again, when we look at water availability all over this region, what we see is risk looks very different for each country and what each country needs to do to address that risk is quite different. Um, as I turn it over to Nino, she's much more of an expert on, on specifics within Georgia, but I did want to end with something um, that, an analysis that was, that was completed relatively recently. We know that the rivers of this region are not in full, but in significant part fed by the Caucasian glaciers. And the Greater Caucasus glaciers, um, after years of arguing that there wasn't a good way to measure it, um, the analysis has been done in a very credible analysis that looked at the time period from 1960 to 2014. The assessment is that since 1960, the glaciers of this region have receded by 29%. And most of that recession has happened in more recent years. And at the current rate, if it does not increase but sustains at the level that it is, the glaciers of the Caucasus are receding at the rate of 0.7% a year. So we are losing the Caucasus glaciers at the rate of nearly 1% per year. So, from a regional security perspective, I would strongly encourage all of you to think in security terms about where we are headed with water in a part of the world that's usually regarded as being quite water rich. And with that, I'll turn it over to Nina. Thanks a lot, uh, Teresa, for highlighting especially uh, water and water scarcity that can become one more driver of conflict also here in the region. And with that, I hand over to Nino to elaborate more on that, but also to add on some other risks uh, that climate change will bring about. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to uh, presenters uh, before me. Um, so we heard uh, a global context. What is the problem with climate change and what are the worldwide agreements in this regard? We also heard very important uh, information about water resources and um, importance of water resources, which might be uh, availability of which might be affected by changing climate. I would like to speak a little bit um, about uh, impact of climate change as we know it now uh, for the South Caucasus region, for our countries in the region, and um, try to link this to any potential security implications. 
Um, first of all, I would like to highlight that uh, there is no doubt uh, that, uh, and there is no uh, room for doubt actually that scientific evidence shows that climate change is already taking place in this region. We have um, lots of information, as mentioned um, earlier. The, uh, there is um, quite intensive research uh, ongoing, uh, especially during the last 10 years or so. And uh, we have uh, already information and trends show that, there is, um, that this region will become warmer and will become drier. So there is, um, uh, the, the trend is that uh, temperatures are increasing, that we have much more frequent and intense extreme weather conditions that are creating sometimes disastrous situations. And we also have projections that precipitation will um, decline, so it will be less. And um, um, all of this actually makes us think that uh, oh, this will have um, an impact on national economies, on transboundary um, relationship between these countries. And again, we've heard a very good example of transboundary water uh, usage um, and um, demand for water resources. And of course, such um, trend, if it really happens, will have impact on, on economies. And if it has impact on economies, then it has impact on livelihoods and on human health and on agriculture, on energy sector, etc., etc. So I think this is crucially important to, to take um, a note of this. And this uh, obviously is quite a challenge for three countries. Um, but um, uh, it is a more than challenge, actually. It uh, sometimes uh, may even be considered as a problem. Uh, why? Because on one hand, our countries have um, commitments and obligations towards those worldwide um, agreements, and uh, like Paris Agreement, or in George's case, uh, we are association member of European Union and thus have our own obligation. Uh, Georgia is also a member of energy community, which uh, definitely gives us even more responsibility to set the target and increase share of renewables in overall energy mix. Um, but the, the problem is that we, we try to have um, uh, transform this research uh, information and evidences into policies, still the systemic gaps does not permit us actually to have this full consideration and mainstreaming. So that's why it is crucially important to have um, climate policies in place. And the problem uh, we face in our countries is also that uh, it's not only because of severity or exposure to climatic uh, hazards or these um, potential risks, but also a limited adaptive capacity. So we don't have uh, right systems in place to actually fully monitor, assess, analyze this climatic information and make all the good modeling and projections on what would be the real implications and how we can consider and mainstream this in our development agenda, overall development agenda. So for example, uh, in our countries we lack or we have inadequate uh, regulatory frameworks or legislation that may support um, such considerations or such uh, policy development. Or we may have uh, limited resources, both in terms of technical knowledge and also financial resources. And whatever is being done is quite often uh, supported, or in majority of cases are supported by development organizations, by donor organizations. And um, uh, while we have uh, lots of good work that is being done in terms of uh, changing legislation or regulatory frameworks, etc., still it takes time and um, still we need to, to start doing actual very specific and concrete adaptation measures. Uh, we know that the, the biggest problem is uh, emission, like human factor in climate change. 
And um, as mentioned earlier, this region is not the biggest emitter of CO2. Uh, however, we are uh, also in line with other countries and we need to um, reduce emissions and we need to decarbonate our energy sector. But it will take time and uh, those people and those, uh, you know, the, the local, especially local population, they can't wait for this. So these mitigation actions will, some, for them, may come quite late or it will require time. And that's why it is important to invest and make sure that we do assess climatic risks as uh, intensively as possible. And then invest in building resilience, in, in, in uh, reducing risk of such events, and making uh, livelihoods and population more adapted, adapted to to these um, uh, recurrent climatic hazards. Um, in addition to water resources, I would like to also highlight some other, uh, other issues and other risks. I think agriculture, and it's not only that I think, but the evidence shows that agriculture sector is uh, the most affected. And especially if we consider that uh, projections say that um, this region will suffer from shortages of water, this means that uh, agriculture will suffer mostly because uh, in any case, we don't have uh, um, modern irrigation systems, et cetera, et cetera. And moreover, if we lack water, then we need to have better adaptive capacity to actually um, um, not create additional problems uh, in the sector. Uh, uh, these countries are very much prone to climatic hazards. As I mentioned earlier, the frequency and intensity of extreme events are on rise significantly. And the damages, uh, economic losses and damages to infrastructure or livelihoods are, are significant. Um, I can uh, uh, tell you that uh, for last uh, two decades, um, over 14 billion US dollars were assessed as an economic damage to Georgia only, caused by climate-induced um, disasters and hazards. And um, of course, uh, that includes uh, casualties, um, priceless human life, uh, around 150 in the last 20 years or so, and only 21 out of this 120, 150 uh, died in 2015 Tbilisi flooding situation. And many of us would remember the devastating effect of this uh, uh, disastrous event in the capital. So, uh, so I think uh, we know that uh, this region is quite vulnerable to climate change, but, and it is a challenge and problem, but it is also an opportunity. And I think it is important that we, um, we make sure that um, this uh, opportunity is used in a right manner. And this is all about sustainable development. And we know that sustainable, uh, we, we, we say that uh, uh, sustainable development is a peace policy for future. And without proper adaptation and mitigation to climate change, we will not have sustainable development. If, and if there is no sustainable development, then there is no peace and stability. And I think uh, it is important uh, to really unlock those um, social and economic benefits that may lead us to greener economy, to creating jobs, etc. So. For example, when we speak about um, increasing share of renewables in overall energy mix, and in other words, developing other sectors of energy rather than uh, traditional fossil fuel based um, uh, energy, then this may create new job opportunities. This may uh, make uh, our economies greener and uh, more effective. And I think uh, this is really important. And we should look at, uh, at this challenge and this problem of climate change as an opportunity for developing our countries in a uh, more sustainable manner. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Nino. First of all, also for highlighting that basically with climate change uh, unfolding, all uh, essential human rights are at risk. If you look at right for food, right for water, right for housing, uh, right of life, so on. We see really that um, although we had a decline in poverty rates and hunger rates around the world for the last decade, that the numbers are now increasing again and the UN attributes this directly to climate change. Um, but also for highlighting that we should not see climate change only as a threat, but also as an opportunity to act. And I really like your sense in saying uh, turning policies to sustainable policies is actually also peace policy, because I think we not only really would like to avoid living in a three to four degree world at the end of the century, because this will be a major driver of conflict, but we can also unlock a lot of uh, economic potential, of social potential, and actually create a better life for us all. So I must say that I'm really happy that there are not so many points on this uh, slider, because I really, if people uh, ask questions, I really like to see them move, and uh, I like to see their faces. So because we have only, uh, not even half an hour left, I would, uh, ask for a first round uh, of questions right now and if we see that we have time at the end then we will i will give the word to the panelists again and maybe also add some questions from my side so now the floor is yours not to type but to raise your hands and talk into a real microphone yes please but now the question is do we have microphones yeah we do uh so hello again um i'm nana priscolani energy expert for Georgia Tupolesi. So first of all, thank you, dear speakers, for your very interesting speeches. And my question goes to uh, Professor Teresa Sabon himself. <laughs> uh, so you know that uh, Georgia conducted the state policy to develop the uh, hydropower, uh, hydro potential. So it means in uh, several years to be built dozens of hydropower plants, which means that the whole management system of the river will change. Uh, so, as you like to mention, uh, there is the uh, basket full with risks. So, how do you think? Uh, I mean, I'm interested in your assessment. How to assess what, how how the country can choose first to uh, support the development of hydro potential and um, gain more independence from our neighboring countries in terms of energy security and at the same time to care about the environmental issues. So this is the main challenges I see today and I would like to hear your assessment regarding this. Thank you so much. All those of you who are citizens of Georgia know that this has been a very hot debate. Um, the Georgian government put a huge priority on building as much hydro as possible a few years back. Um, and that went from a policy that was widely embraced to one that's very controversial. Um, and there are several things that we have to consider when we think about um, Georgia's future energy security. The first is that Georgia has a whole series of old dams that are already in place that are badly in need of renovation and appropriate maintenance. And any time we think about trying to strike that balance between energy security um, and environmental sensitivity, uh, first thing you have to look at is what do you already have and how well are you using it? Um, and the efficiency of energy production from hydropower in Georgia um, in several places where the renovations have been done, it's demonstrated that it, it can be dramatically better than it is. Um, and as many of you are probably aware, there's a very controversial situation up at Nguri, um, which is a facility where the dam is on the Georgia side and the power plant is on the Abkhaz controlled side of the border. Um, a decision was just taken early this week, um, excuse me, last week, uh, that um, the international donors, a community of them, are going to fund the rehabilitation um, of some of the power facility over there and several of the downstream hydro facilities on the Abkhaz side in exchange for Abkhazia learning to use electricity better, um, to manage it and meter it somewhat better. I um, mean, this brings me to the next thing. Um, Georgia, in the, in the energy law, 
Georgia is about to adopt three laws at once, the base energy law, the energy efficiency law, and the renewable energy law. Um, and it's quite extraordinary. It's very rare that a nation would adopt all three of those at the same time. Um, but one of the things that is exciting about that um, is that Georgia has taken a decision to increase electricity prices for industry, and they've done it for what I regard a very strategic reason. And that is Georgia is very inefficient in its use of electricity. But the people are rather poor, so who has the capacity to learn how to use electricity more efficiently the best? Well, it is industry, and in exchange for raising the prices on industry, the Georgian government is going to extend technical assistance and do energy efficiency audits for major industry in Georgia. And following that, we are hoping that the culture of energy efficiency and the analysis of it spreads out further from there. So second part of my answer to you, renovate what you have, use your electricity better rather than thinking that what you always need is more. But then in the third instance, um, Georgia is building a platform to be able to trade electricity all across the region. And your most effective gains, both in security and in efficiency, and actually in cost, come from recognizing what your comparative advantages are. So sometimes Georgia will sell electricity, sometimes Georgia will buy electricity. Um, building a system that integrates into the region makes more sense for Georgia than trying to be completely self-reliant. Um, you do need some new hydropower, but the government needs to do a better job of clear assessment and comparing projects to each other. In my assessment, over-privatization of this process leads you to just believe each company about what the merits are of each project. There should be capacity within the government to comparatively assess those projects um, and to quality control those projects. Thanks a lot. I pass on the mic to our... Thank you. Um, I just wanted to re-emphasize that Human security will only be a possibility in a two-degree world, not in a, in a four-degree world. And for this, we need to decrease global emissions to zero by the middle of the century. And right now, our emissions are still rising, posing significant risks for countries that are particularly exposed or where particularly um, vulnerable populations, such as poor people, live. And yeah, maybe we can also um, discuss what this implicates uh, for, for the security sector as a, as a whole. Yes, we can. That would actually be one of my questions. If there is no other question from the floor right now, then I would really like to add this one because um, uh, I noted to, uh, down two questions from, from my side looking at this nexus of uh, security policies and, uh, and climate change. One is also on adaptation. I mean, we hear a lot about how we need to uh, adapt probably um, security grant strategies. But I would like to ask you whether you have heard on any very practical uh, measures like do we have to move army bases um, from areas that are very close to the coast or uh, from areas that are maybe flood prone, prone to landslides, looking at possible disasters. And the second question, I mean, for, for you, especially in the audience, it might sound very funny maybe not to only discuss about uh, electric uh, buses or electric cars, but also about electric tanks uh, or maybe about putting solar roofs. Uh, on army barracks, but I mean, as Kira Winkel said, we all we want to avoid this a plus three to plus uh, four degree world, and that means zero for all nations across all sectors globally by 2050. So we are talking about a zero emission arms industry. We are talking about zero emission uh, state forces. And do you see any movement into this direction? Who would like to answer first? Um, I think um, I would like to comment on the ad adaptation capacities, right? I mentioned very briefly, but um, um, uh, let's take uh, climate-induced hazards. Um, do we know uh, what uh, impact they may cause to us? 
do does local population know actually or are prepared for this um, do they know how to behave does uh, local municipalities have uh, uh, preparedness um, plans in place to uh, to respond adequately or um, do local farmers like subsistence farmers know what type of crops they need to uh, grow and uh, how would they be better adapted to the situation? Do we have uh, uh, proper forecasting systems uh, for all these climate-induced hazards or weather-related hazards? And do we have good monitoring uh, network, actually? Do we have uh, technologies supporting us and or legislation supporting collection and analysis of all of this? I think this is very, very important. And this is um, uh, this um, modeling, if I may say so, using monitoring data and then uh, analysis of this data and forecasting could be used for uh, uh, early warning systems. And what we see in our region, and I can easily say this about Georgia, because of the lack of early warning systems, then we uh, faced uh, problems like in 2015 uh, Tbilisi flooding situation and uh, we had significant economic uh, loss and damages to infrastructure and we also had casualties. If early warning system was in place then uh, I believe and uh, all experts believe that uh, we would not have had such an impact. I mean, this event would have taken place in any case, but we would have been better prepared actually to avoid bigger damage and at least save lives. So I think this um, is one of the examples of showing uh, problems that we have in terms of having adaptive uh, capacity and actually showing need for having such uh, systems in place. Actually, I'm uh, happy to say that uh, Georgia received uh, uh, a big uh, grant for uh, adaptation from Green Climate Fund and from Swiss government. And uh, UNDP, organization that I represent, is uh, implementing this big 70 million US dollar program on uh, establishing uh, multi-hazard early warning systems in Georgia and improving and upgrading hydro meteorological network and um, uh, establishing these forecasting and early warning uh, platforms, including last mile early warning, like going on the level of local communities and building local capacities because these are people who actually are affected mostly. And uh, while uh, assessing this situation, we also noticed, um, we, we um, observed a lack of knowledge or awareness on cl of climate change on local levels. When, when you ask people, even like municipal authorities, if they do anything in terms of prevention or climate change adaptation, they have really very poor knowledge on the impact that climate change may cause. The, in some cases, they only think that this is about warming, this is about changing weather, you know, temperature, or, um, uh, or and that's it. So uh, actually, in some cases, they do some work, but it's not systematized, it is not using the same unified methodologies, and um, there is no, still the, the mm, reaction of local uh, municipalities is more response-oriented rather than preventative. And I think this is uh, very important that needs to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Uh, I just wanted to uh, stress and emphasize the last point that you made is that I think um, with regards to security policy, it is in the strategic interest of a country to be able to, um, to have an early warning system not only uh, related to geopolitical threats, but also related to climate threats. So um, this is not only important um, 
in, in terms of uh, being able to forecast extreme weather events, but also uh, for policymakers to be able to adequately represent their countries in uh, these climate negotiations. Um, we've heard this earlier that um, actually we're not sitting here in a high emitting country um, and uh, I wonder um, what kind of pressure is being put um, by this region, for example, towards nations uh, like the nations that we are coming from, like Germany, like the United States, that are fundamentally contributing to global emissions. So um, I would like to, to, for us to think about it this way as well. So if I may, that is a very nice link to one of the questions that is showing up now on the screen, um, the withdrawal of the US that will hopefully never come become uh, effective, but maybe you could also uh, address this question in your answer. Sure. So the United States has wrought havoc repeatedly with climate negotiations. Um, the reality is that the United States plus China account for 40% of all global emissions at the present time, the day-to-day -day emissions. So in advance of the Paris negotiation, the United States and China cut a bilateral deal about how they would cooperate to reduce emissions, improve energy efficiency, and begin to address water issues that particularly concern China. That agreement became the United States and China's going in position for Paris. And frankly, it's one of the reasons that Paris succeeded, because you already had the United States and China behind it. I'm concerned partly about the United States non-participation um, and partly about the United States uh, beginning to cease some of the cooperation that we were doing bilaterally with China. Um, I think that it is very important that the lead emitters um, set the tone and, and set expectations for each other. I don't think that the United States will fully withdraw from, um, from the climate negotiations. And in fact, I don't know how many of you follow climate, but at the last conference, which are compelled by the treaty to happen every two years, at the last conference there was a huge delegation from the United States called We're Still In. Because one of the strangest things about the Paris Agreement, and maybe one of the things that in the end makes it the most powerful, is it is the first large-scale multilateral treaty agreement that is what we call polylateral. The signatories are not only countries. They're also cities, major corporations, um, and all kinds of other actors. Um, and I think that this is structured in such a way that even if we have unenlightened governance at the top in the United States, we still have important participation of a lot of cities of the United States, of corporations, and we still have the enthusiastic participation of several venture capital companies that have committed to invest in the next generation of energy. Um, so the good thing about Paris is that it isn't only states that belong. Um, it's a lot of other actors that are, can have an impact on the outcome. And to the discussion about resilience, I want to point out what I think is a really important contribution being made by foundations. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation has identified what they call 100 resilient cities. These were cities that agreed to be a model of data sharing. They appointed a chief resilience officer who was responsible for assessing the city and reporting regularly about its vulnerabilities. And these 100 cities are located all over the world and they're trying to use them as a basis to collect data and best practices for smaller cities around the world to understand. And they've already begun to do a really important job with identifying most cost-effective resilience measures. Okay, thanks a lot. We now have uh, three more questions on specific uh, actors. First of all, I would like to underline what you just said is true not only for the US, with a lot of cities, communities saying we are still in. So actually, uh, as far as I know, US is still on track, yeah. basically despite Trump to reach their climate targets. And we see this movement really around the world. I just uh, had the chance last week to meet with the vice mayor of Kutaisi. Kutaisi also joined the covenant of mayors in she uh, is really looking into options now also to turn Kutaisi um, more towards renewable energy. And this is uh, also beca because she says uh, this is a very good way of having more jobs, of having more local welfare. 
uh, and she would also encourage more communities, of course, to look into this issue. Now, um, we will end, uh, well, or we'll next focus on three special um, actors. One is the special role of youth. I don't know whether you have Friday for the future demonstration here in uh, Tbilisi. We have it in a lot of countries now uh, uh, around the world. And then we have one question about uh, how it's called now, the Ministry for Environmental Protection and Agriculture uh, in Georgia. So maybe, Nino, you would like to, to uh, answer uh, on this. And uh, then we have uh, one more matter, that is um, the framing of the climate change discourse and I think this is the question how can we make sure that climate change discourse is not only uh, perceived as an environmental uh, issue but on a wider scope so maybe we can uh, end on this point and close also the panel in time. So I'm looking to the panelists who would like to comment on the youth question. You okay and then also on the ministry in Georgia. I don't see the questions, unfortunately, I neither don't from here. So I don't know okay. what is the question about Ministry of Environment. Okay. If you can read it. What uh, role do you see? What role do you see for the Ministry of Environment Protection and Agriculture of Georgia in regards to climate change? So we know that these uh, ministries have recently been merged, right? Yes. So maybe you. Yeah. Um, okay, first, uh, perhaps I can comment on the youth or the role of youth in um, fighting against climate change. I think um, youth uh, as young generation is, is important to, um, to be used, if I may say so, for uh, increasing awareness and for being a, a real driving force. And uh, we know that worldwide there is this uh, climate action or protest going on, especially in, uh, in Europe. I, um, I don't think that uh, Georgia or uh, Armenia or Azerbaijan are actually uh, on the same level. However, I can say a few words about uh, youth clubs or eco clubs, as we call them, that, are, uh, all, that have already a history in Georgia. Uh, that are run with the support of civil society organizations, environmental, like green uh, NGOs, um, and they prove to be very, very, very successful, really. It's a, a real pleasure, actually, to work with these young people because they are uh, also educating their families. We have so many good examples when they go back home and they they transfer those that knowledge or the issues that they, they discuss in eco clubs which are part of informal education on several environmental issues and climate could be one of those issues but it's about forest systems or waste management or separation etc etc so i think the role of use is is important and we need to make sure that we engage them through different uh, platforms could be uh, those informal uh, eco clubs or climate clubs in uh, schools, for example, for uh, young um, generation, or uh, students like young uh, young people who are motivated, who will be happy actually to go back and also uh, trans transfer the the, the information. Um, uh, actually, the, the program I mentioned on establishing these early warning uh, systems is also about creating or preparing um, uh, hazard uh, maps and risk profiles for all river basins, for the, the whole watersheds uh, covering entire country. And there will be lots of work done on local level. And uh, one of the mechanisms actually to... Um, to develop those local capacities is working with uh, youth groups and uh, those eco clubs. So I think uh, we will have a chance, at least in Georgia, in coming next uh, five, six years or so, to have more engagement and more work with, with young people. Uh, now, question regarding uh, the merger of the Ministry of Environment Protection and Agriculture. Uh, there was a, a lot of uh, speculation in that uh, regard. Uh, 
and there was uh, it was disputed quite significantly but uh, one would look at it as an opportunity again uh, it's a big ministry but it has a very specific role in related to to climate change and as mentioned uh, earlier in my presentation uh, because agriculture sector is seems to be mostly affected i think uh, having these two together is an opportunity actually to make sure that these policies are fully integrated in agriculture development um, as well. On the other hand, uh, on anything related to climate change on policy level, but also for international commitments that our country has, this ministry is um, the focal ministry. It has a, a, a separate climate change uh, service or division, uh, which is uh, coordinating everything related to climate change, including calculations for greenhouse gas emissions, inventories, preparing national communications uh, uh, for UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, or coordinating other, um, uh, other state agencies uh, uh, for uh, harmonizing uh, legislation related to climate change to towards uh, uh, EU uh, uh, directives, for example, water directive or flood directive, etc. So I think, uh, if, if I understand the, the question correctly, the, in my opinion, merging these two ministries is a challenging situation because it's very big ministry. But on the other hand, it, we may look at it as an opportunity because uh, there is obviously a link between these two, two big areas. Okay? Thanks a lot. So uh, in Germany, I would say we still have two split ministries, one for uh, environment, including climate change, and one for agriculture. They are fighting all of the time. So because also the ministries are coming from different parties. Um, so I'm not sure whether this is particularly helpful. But before we also turn to Berlin and uh, learn a little bit more about the Friday to, for the future demonstrations that happen in front of both ministries, actually, uh, let's turn to the US. So I, I thought I was going to talk about framing. You want me to talk about youth? Um, one thing I'd like to say about Georgia and climate and making it more real. Um, Nino just informed me, and I'm not sure how I missed this, but Tbilisi was accepted into the Rockefeller Foundation program on resilient cities. That means that under that that Tbilisi has received resources for better tracking and communicating what they're doing to make the city more resilient. And that means that information is publicly available. So I see that as an extraordinary educational opportunity. Many years ago in the 1990s, um, the Peace Corps volunteers in several very authoritarian post-Soviet countries went to rural provinces and what they did was they brought water testing kits for the elementary schools. And they taught children how to test the quality of their own water. And it was a brilliant thing about empowering young people, empowering the public, and making people understand how important science is to their own everyday life and to their risk. I strongly encourage one of the most important things about youth movements is to make sure that our young people are grounded in knowledge. Because increasingly, we have the bad habit of only listening to news we already agree with and only collecting information from people that we think will agree with us. So encouraging our young people to continue to take a scientific approach to information, encouraging our young people to challenge the quality of things like water where they live, I think is an extremely important project in any democracy. I do teach an evening course at Georgetown University and I always tell my Georgetown students in energy that the transformation of the global economy to completely non-carbon will happen not as rapidly as they hope, but much more rapidly than the kernels that I teach in my everyday work. Um, I think it is from the young people that we get the optimism about changing this enormous global system that is very much baked in. Um, and, and that dynamism um, has to be there. We have to be willing to break that system and move forward. Thanks a lot. Let's see whether Kira Winke agrees to that. 
Yes, I, I do agree, but I would like to say a few words more, um, maybe also adding one more story to this. A um, few weeks ago, I spoke in front of uh, members of the German military, and it was on a Thursday, meaning the next day the climate strikes of the students were on. And I asked them if their children are protesting. And a lot of them said, yes, my children are protesting. And I think the youth uh, that is now being engaged in this topic is ex doing exactly this. It's, um, it's driving the climate topic into different sectors of society, into different sectors um, of, um, of how we uh, run our economy. And it's not only a protest against uh, the effects of climate change, but in the end, it's how we run our economic system. So it's also the Extinction Rebellion. The UN report showed that we have a million species at risk of extinction. This is a real crisis, um, but we still have time to act. And this I would like to, to, to emphasize. In Germany, we have already depleted many of our insect species. Maybe here there's still a chance uh, to not repeat those mistakes that we have made. And then I don't only want to leave on this sort of grim note, but also want to tell another story of the Paris Climate Agreement. Imagine you wake up in the city and it is quiet because the cars are running on electricity. The air is clean. We eat food for which we do not have to torture animals to have it. I can get on a train to come here, to go to Istanbul, fast speed train. This is the statement of peace that is somehow included in the Paris Agreement. Thank you very much for these almost uh, final words. Let me uh, really also emphasize that this was only a small glimpse in this afternoon into the huge area of climate and security debate. But uh, I really like what you said about the reframing. And I think this is also maybe the uh, takeaway message from this, uh, this panel that uh, we can do a double reframing of this climate discourse. First, not only to see it as an environmental threat. This is, yes, it is about polar bears, but not only about polar bears. So I personally think it was uh, not a clever move to put the polar bear on the melting ice as a symbol of climate change, because this is a human challenge. This is the biggest social challenge of the 21st century. And uh, this, of course, makes it also a huge security challenge. But we also have to do not only a reframing from environmental discourse to social discourse and security discourse, but also from a discourse about risks to a, a discourse about opportunities and creating the chance for a sustainable, as you said, better life for all. And with this, I would like to close almost in time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the panelists. And you will be around for a while, so uh, if some of the question comes up, then please ask the panelists during the coffee break. Okay, and we will go to the coffee break now. We have uh, until 5.30 for the break. Then we will split up in two sessions. There will be the session five. There will be the session five on hybrid threats will, be, will take place here. And the breakout session on Iran will take place in a, another room, which is basically across the hall, but there are signs to that room as well. Yeah? So at 5.30, we'll continue. Thank you.